telly ho lads, we're off to France, chocks away and we'll be in Berlin by tea time. It'll all be over by Christmas, I'll bring you back half of the Kaiser's moustache. Britain declares war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914. Of course Britain already has an army at this point known as the British Expeditionary Force or BEF and they're very experienced. They've been in a lot of wars in the run up to World War I against... I don't remember. And they'd won most of them. When they arrive in France they are feted as heroes with cheering crowds and free drinks. But there aren't many of them, comparatively. The BEF is smaller than Belgium's army, for example. At the beginning of the war, Germany has 850,000 soldiers and 2.9 million reservists, whereas Britain can call on just 235,000 soldiers, most of whom are stationed in India. So, the war secretary, Lord Kitchener, fresh off running concentration camps in South Africa, realises pretty quickly that this is going to be a long and bloody war requiring unprecedented manpower, and he initiates a call for volunteers. Britain doesn't introduce conscription until 1916, so for the first year and a half of the war, the British army is a volunteer army. You might be familiar with this magazine cover saying your country needs you, and Yes, if you're familiar with the Uncle Sam version of this, I'm afraid it's a copy of this one featuring Lord Kitchener and his ridiculous moustache. You have to be at least 5 foot 3, 19 to 35 years old, with at least a 34 inch chest when you breathe in. The campaign is unbelievably successful. Millions of men sign up, happy, nay eager, to go to the front and give Jerry a good bashing. In September and October 1914, the equivalent of the entire city of Oxford is signing up every week. On one single day in September, 330,000 men sign up. 300,000 are recruited in the first month alone. By the end of the year, it is over a million. And by the time conscription is brought in in 1916, it is two million. Recruitment stations have queues around the block, like they're selling concert tickets. And this doesn't even include everyone who isn't in the army, but volunteers to do war work elsewhere. Doctors joining the Red Cross, seamstresses going into munitions factories, ambulance drivers, cooks and welders heading to the front to help out where they can. We know now that the war is also a catastrophic loss of life of a kind that had not been seen so far in world history. So what leads all these people to the conclusion that joining the war is a worthwhile thing to do, something they'd be willing to risk their lives for? In this video, we're going to look at the tactics and tricks to make a person sign up to go. As always, this is a London history channel, so we'll be sticking to London history and a little bit more broadly British history, but feel free to share sources on other countries in the comments and as always, I'll be putting my sources either on screen or in the description. If you disagree with me, I'm happy to learn, but you're going to need to provide a source too. I don't expect you to believe me without sources. Please extend me the same courtesy. So, what did you do during the war? But first, a word from today's sponsor, Siegfried Sassoon. Sassoon is one of the most beloved British anti-war poets. You smug-faced crowds with kindling eye who cheer when soldier lads march by. Sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go. He is very publicly against the war, writing an open letter to his commanding officer saying, I believe that the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. This war, upon which I entered as a war of defence and liberation, has now become a war of aggression and conquest." And yet Sassoon was desperate to go to war. He actually joined the army before the war even started, that's how keen he was. He wrote, 
After all, dying for one's native land was believed to be the most glorious thing one could possibly do. But during his training in Britain, he breaks his arm, so he doesn't get to go to France for well over a year. When he finally gets there, he lasts less than a year before he gets gastric fever and has to go home for another six months. He finally gets sent out again in March 1917, whereupon he's promptly shot through the shoulder and has to go back to Britain again. He recovers that and asks to go back again. He's shot in the head by one of his own company, has to go back to England again, this time for good, and he survives the war. The war tries to kill him very hard, and each time he asks to go back. He is against the war, and he still asks to go back. In his case, a big part of the reason he's so anxious to go is survivor's guilt. When he's recovering from the shoulder injury, he imagines the floor of his hospital room covered in bodies. He says, they look at me reproachfully, because I'm so lucky with my safe wound. Collect your free PTSD today at madjack.com slash jdraperlondon. Another reason that people sign up is to defend the innocent. School children today learn that World War I starts after the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austro-Hungary is shot in Sarajevo in Serbia. And yet when Britain joins in, it doesn't declare war on either Austro-Hungary or Serbia, but Germany. So from the beginning, Brits are not joining up to defend Serbian nationalism, but to defend France, Luxembourg, and particularly Belgium against German invasion. A big reason given for why you should join up is to protect the women and children of Belgium against German atrocities. Posters say, remember Belgium. By 1915, wild rumours are spreading about torture, rape, infanticide and mutilations committed in Belgium by German troops. One English convent is said to be sheltering Belgian girls who had their hands cut off. There's a popular rumour that Germans have crucified Canadian soldiers by pinning them to a barn door with bayonets. The most notorious rumour of all is that of the... Kadawawerwertungsanstalt? The Corpse Utilisation Factory. The story goes that the Germans are gathering up battlefield corpses, including their own, to be boiled down for pig feed, fertiliser, soap, margarine, boot polish, candles, you name it. This was reported as fact in the Times and the Daily Mail, who, because of government censorship, are starved for real news stories to write about and have to start printing poorly sourced tripe like this instead. It's animal corpses, not human ones. But such is the popular hysteria against Germans that you can buy a German war crimes calendar, giving you the anniversaries of supposed atrocities. Obviously you want to fight against such a cartoonishly evil enemy, so a lot of British propaganda uses the imagery of burned out Belgian and French towns, calling on you to do something to help. Every time the German armed forces do something like execute a nurse or torpedo a ship full of civilians, you can count on the British government to crank out a whole load of new posters telling you that you can prevent this from happening again if you'd only sign up. To be clear, Germany does terrorise the Belgian and French citizenry with some awful acts, including mass executions of civilians and the deliberate destruction of cultural sites like Heim Cathedral and the library at Louvain. But they aren't melting down their own soldiers into candles. Another big reason is, weirdly enough, FOMO. I swear to God. You might be familiar with the idea that people thought the war would be over by Christmas. Not only does this give the impression that it'll be quick and relatively bloodless, but also, if it's only going to be three months, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to be the only one in your workplace or university class that didn't go. In fact, people from the same trade or area or even sports club all go and sign up together 
and get put in the same battalion. There are battalions entirely made up of Birmingham clerks or Northeastern railway workers. And these are huge. Two thirds of all the volunteer battalions are so-called PALS battalions. Hull alone has five PALS battalions called the whole black coats, the whole tradesmen, the whole commercials, the whole sportsmen and athletes, and to others. This system is really good for morale at first, although when entire battalions start being wiped out, it means that a whole town might go into mourning simultaneously. Early recruits are pretty cheery about the idea of a world war. They hang signs from their trains saying, next stop Berlin. They don't seem to have realised that this won't be a quick jaunt around Europe. Not that no one told them. Lord Kitchener, the Prime Minister David Lloyd George and Field Marshal Haig explicitly speak of the war to come as a prolonged struggle. But a lot of the young men signing up don't seem to realise it. Obviously the recruitment posters don't show young men dying in muddy holes or having their toes eaten by rats. There is a distinct lack of imagination about the possibility of defeat or death. But another big reason for signing up is the idea that a soldier's life is glamorous. Remember, in 1914, there are still a lot of literal slums in the country. After the war, the chief sanitary inspector for Bethnal Green, a very poor area of London, said that 12,000 men from the area had served and that these men have learned that life holds, or should hold, something more than an existence in a gloomy alley four foot wide in a house not large enough to allow one to stand upright in it. If you have a terrible, insecure job in an Edwardian factory and live four to a room in a slum, it's not going to take much for you to decide that joining the army would be better. And if cajoling, jingoism and FOMO don't persuade you men to sign up, there's always shame. Posters are produced asking you to imagine having to explain to your children that you didn't do anything during the war. And to drive this message home, the government draws on a huge untapped resource, women. Half the country is made up of women, so the government knows that they can be useful for something, but the idea of putting them in uniform, or even putting them in munitions factories, is absolutely abhorrent in a way that's hard to imagine now. They might take their corsets off. They might shorten their skirts. They might cut their hair. They might have disposable income. We have this idea that as soon as the war started, the government calls on women to take men's jobs. But actually it's the other way round. Women have to fight to be allowed to take jobs in munitions factories and field hospitals. This is the Women's Right to Serve March in 1915, where 40,000 people march through Hyde Park in support of men's jobs being opened up to women for the duration of the war. The East Anglian Daily Times writes, Think of the hours spent in organising a march of 40,000 through London. Think of the waste of energy, wasted solely because all the time these women were begging to serve, they might have been serving. Think of the potential output of some 40,000 women working for, say, eight hours a day. So if the authorities don't want women to be doing men's jobs, what are they supposed to do? Peer pressure their menfolk into joining up. I am not kidding. Posters like this one encourage women to put pressure on their fiancés, husbands and brothers. The idea is to channel women's energy, their urge to do something to help, into something properly feminine. Being the moral centre of the family. The writer, Henry Arthur Jones, says, The English girl who will not know the man, lover, brother or friend, that cannot show an overwhelming reason for not taking up arms, that girl will do her duty and will give good help to her country. Posters and pamphlets read, If you cannot persuade him to answer his country's call and protect you now, discharge him as unfit. 
And is your best boy wearing khaki? If not, don't you think he should be? If he does not think that you and your country are worth fighting for, do you think he is worthy of you? And peer pressure works! That's why all your friends are already signed up at patreon.com slash jdraperlondon. And we're having loads of fun there without you. Baroness Auxy, who wrote The Scarlet Pimpernel, creates the Women of England's Active Service League, whose 20,000 members pledge never to be seen with a man who would fail to do his part. She says, Women and girls of England, you cannot shoulder a rifle, but you can actually serve her in the way she needs most. Give her the men whom she wants. The most notorious expression of this idea is the White Feather Campaign. The idea is you, the woman, walk around in public with a pocket of white feathers, handing them out to men you see wearing civvies. The white feather is a symbol of cowardice, so you are publicly shaming the man into joining up. At first, the authorities sort of tacitly endorse this. The white feather movement is never given official blessing, but, you know, they're not hurting anything, right? They might be swelling the numbers a little. But after a few months, when wounded soldiers start coming back, it becomes clear that this is actually very destructive. Because of course, you don't know why a bloke's in civvies. He could be ineligible for the army, he could be doing essential war work at home, he could be underage or disabled, and even if he isn't, maybe he doesn't feel like joining a literal world war. There are multiple accounts of wounded soldiers being given white feathers. Sometimes even when they're like missing a leg or a hand. I'll give you a typical one as an idea. A grenadier guardsman, wounded at Neuve Chapelle and passing his period of convalescence at Southport, was walking along one of the main streets in plain clothes, owing to his wound, when a fashionably dressed lady handed him a white feather. The astounded guardsman observed, you might have given me this six months ago before I went to the front. Whereupon the lady beat a hasty retreat. I know what you're thinking. And then everybody clapped. It definitely seems the kind of story that's a bit suspect, right? Like there's no mention of who the guardsman is, or who the lady is, or how the paper found out about this story. But there are so many stories like this that whether this particular one is real or not, it is at least a common story at the time. I've never seen any figures on how many people took part in the White Feather movement, but several people interviewed years after the war tell stories about being given white feathers or seeing them given out. So. It's not out of the realm of possibility for something like this to happen. It also gives us an idea of public opinion of the White Feather Movement. Looking through newspaper articles, I found very few praiseworthy mentions. Instead, there are lots of stories like this about them getting dunked on. Holy. Soldiers Uno reversing the public humiliation onto them. It turns out that the authorities are very happy to tell women to pressure men to enlist, but when women actually do it, the authorities are pretty horrified. These women are bitches. Leonard Darwin makes a speech to the Women's League of Honour where he tells them to send their men to war, and in the same speech he says, those women who go up to young men in the street and abuse them for not enlisting show no courage on the woman's part but merely a complete absence of modesty. Yeah, that's what's wrong with the Order of the White Feather. They're being immodest. So really, these posters aren't aimed at women. They're aimed at men. They want men to see these posters and join up before his fiancée does something so unpardonably ignorant as to tell him to go. The government telling men what to do is fine and correct. A woman telling a man what to do is crossing a line. So if you hear about the White Feather campaign online, it's generally mentioned in the same breath as the suffragette movement. And particularly, one of the suffragette movement's most famous members, Emmeline Pankhurst. By some accounts, it almost seems as if, upon the outbreak of war, all the suffragettes simply dropped their window-smashing hammers and picked up white feathers instead, like there's a one-to-one -one correlation between 
members of the suffrage movement and members of the white feather movement. I myself have said in the past that the most famous suffragette, Emmeline Pankhurst, was involved in the white feather movement. So I'll be honest, when I was writing the first draft of this video, I was just going to say Mrs Pankhurst pivoted from the suffragette movement into the white feather movement during World War One. Isn't that awful? Moving on. But then I had to look for a period newspaper to put on the screen here. And I couldn't find one. And I thought, that's weird. I could have sworn she was part of the movement. I thought maybe I was going mad. Maybe I was like, oh, maybe I've made this up. So I made some bait. Something the internet, myself included, loves doing is correcting people. So I made one video about recruitment in World War One and one about the suffragette movement where I purposefully tiptoed up to the line of mentioning the White Feather campaign without doing it. And like pigeons to chips, the comments rolled in, telling me that the suffragettes, particularly Emmeline Pankhurst, were horrible people who gave out white feathers and killed their menfolk. Like even pro-suffragette historical fiction like Sally Suffragette shows her as part of the campaign. So why couldn't I find anything? I looked in several biographies of her, including her own, and not one of them mentions the White Feather Movement. I looked in the archive for her newspapers The Suffragette and Britannia and couldn't find any mention of the campaign, let alone an approving one. I looked in the British Newspaper Archive and the Times Archive. Not one mention of Mrs Pankhurst giving out white feathers. She was really good at publicity. You'd think this would be headline news. Now, it is true that Emmeline and her daughter Christabel Pankhurst do switch from campaigning for the vote to campaigning in support of the war effort. They support things like that Women's Right to Serve march. And Christabel in particular writes some pretty jingoistic rubbish like all sectional and class interests should be made subordinate to the national ideal and Germans deform everything they touch. Whatever you may take as an illustration you will find that the German touch deforms and the German spirit corrupts. But I cannot find any period source saying that either of them hand out feathers. The closest I can find is a brief mention in a book by Sylvia Pankhurst where she says she was at a speech given by Emmeline Pankhurst and there were women in the audience giving out white feathers but that's it. Nothing to say that she personally gave them out or that she has ever encouraged anyone to give them out. And the Order of the White Feather is not started by suffragettes, it was started by Admiral Charles Penrose Fitzgerald and 30 women in Folkestone so it's not something that grows out of the suffrage movement. White feather women are generally described as young and fashionable, whereas the stereotype for suffragettes is that they're middle-aged and distinctly unfashionable. So I'm going to put myself in a pretty vulnerable position here because there's a lot of you and I bet there's people out there that are much better than me at research. And what I'm worried about is that I'm going to put my neck on the line for this and then as soon as I post it someone's going to pop up in the comments going uh, yeah if you google Pankhurst White Feather there's a page from her diary uh, in the second result where she talks about giving out white feathers. But I have done my best to look. I've told you where I've looked. If you can find a source I would genuinely love to read it. Please put it in the comments. Crowdsourced historical research! Um, but if you can't find one and I can't find one then we need to stop saying that the suffragettes gave out white feathers because it's not historically accurate. I think what's happened is suffragettes are women who cross the threshold of acceptable womanhood by being violent and white featherers are women who cross the threshold of acceptable womanhood by telling men what to do and we've got them mixed up. The historian Nicola F. Galacci says that feminist historians have tended to dismiss the White Feather campaign as primarily misogynistic propaganda meant to discredit women, which... Nicolette, that's exactly what it's used for. Misogynists love the White Feather campaign. They'll say, 
Suffragettes were perfectly happy to send men out to die when they didn't have to go themselves. They betrayed us, they were evil, they killed men. With the implication left for you to pick up on that therefore they were wrong about the vote too. So you have to be really careful when you talk about it that you don't sound like a misogynist or give ammunition to misogynists. And I think actually the White Feather campaign gives us a really important lesson here. It's really telling that in the Second World War, when women are allowed to join the army and join in war work from the beginning, the White Feather campaign basically doesn't happen. There are like one or two rumours of feathers and that's it. The solution is giving women more power and access and freedom, not less. So after the war, Brits look around at each other, horrified by what they've seen and done. They ask themselves, how did this happen? How did we send millions of men to die for seemingly no reason? And one really good scapegoat is to say, well, it was those white feather women. And we do this so that we don't have to look at the governments and armies that actually send all those men, that don't just pressure them, but force them under threat of imprisonment and death. And so we don't have to worry about whether Field Marshal Haig should be honoured on one of the most prominent streets in the country. Whatever tactics are used to persuade people to volunteer for the armed forces become kind of moot in January 1916 when conscription is introduced for all single men and later married men aged 18 to 41, with exceptions for those doing essential war work at home, the disabled, those with dependents and conscientious objectors. The number of conscientious objectors is comparatively tiny. Only 16,000 successfully claim an objection, and of them, 6,000 refuse to do any war work at all, even medical work or food prep. These are sent to prison, often in solitary confinement or doing hard labour. And even after the war, it's difficult to get a job the first thing the interviewer will ask is, so, what did you do during the war? half of the Kaiser's moustache. Moustache? Moustache? The southern people say moustache? 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 Moustache. It's, it's moustache, isn't it?